Hello beautiful people, it's always a pleasure to have you join us here at the New Times Rwanda. My name is David C. Giro. So today we are having a conversation with a communication specialist, a TV host, the author of a book called Shaped. We're about to talk about Shaped in depth. She is a woman who has used every stone thrown against her to build what she has today. We are going to dive into her life experiences. She's going to share with us everything that has led her to write the book Shaped. The one and only, the lady herself, Barbara Umhoza. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Davis. You're well? Yes, I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for making time to be here. Thank you for hosting me. It's my pleasure. Look, I can't wait to listen to your story. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, but. I think I may have just said a little bit mm -hmm. of who you are, mm -hmm. right? You can just add anything you think I've missed for anyone who is following us, who has seen you for the first time, for them to know who are we going to talk to today. Okay, I think you captured pretty much most of it. Uh, you didn't mention that I have two beautiful boys. One is 10, Cohen. Another one is 5, Keshon. I'm an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. I'm also a pastor. And uh, yeah, I think you captured most of it. Look, your story, we've been seeing um, some of the quotes from your book. But as we said a little while ago, mm -hmm. there is no shape without Barbara Moza. There is no Barbara Moza without shape. I mean, the book. Mm -hmm. But you, before you wrote the book Shaped, I want you to take us through the journey of all these difficult times you had to go through so that people will know what was she shaped from, what shaped her, you know. Uh, there is a way somewhere you say it how the lockdown, in the lockdown you faced very difficult times when we are living alone mm -hmm. without meeting other people but I want you to take us through the whole journey of all these difficult times when you were passing through them you know so that people will know ah so that's what shaped her so that's all that, that molded her that's a very big question um, which is answered by a whole book <laughs> but I, I, I like to think that I wasn't shaped by just one chapter or one piece of my life, but by many chapters, some in the book and some probably not yet in the book because I'm still alive and I'm still being shaped each single day. But I would like to, what comes to my mind is that I was first and foremost shaped by my family. I, I get to write about it in the book. I get to share the role of our family are bringing in who we are, in making us who we are. The early pages of the book are about my upbringing, how I was raised. I was raised by two refugee parents who lived in Burundi, because I was born in Burundi. Of course, we know the history of our country. My mother's side of the family had fled to Burundi. My father's side of the family had fled to Tanzania. Then my father eventually moved to Burundi to work there. That's where he met my mother. That's where they got married. That's where I was born. So growing up in exile, I would say that who I am today started there, obviously, for obvious reasons, because we were raised Rwandan. We were raised with the hope of returning back to Rwanda. We were raised with ideals, Rwandan ideals, Rwandan values. And then through that life, I was a child. I also tell it from a child's perspective, what I can still remember, because it's not everything that I remember, but what I still remember from those years, I write about it. And the way we were raised pretty much plays a big role in who I am today, in my belief of our nation, my randomness, my, my future, my dreams for the future uh, as a random woman. So it started then. 
By telling that part of my story, I highlight the role that parents play in shaping their children. We don't really pay attention to that. And sometimes we don't parent our children intentionally because you're thinking, okay, I have kids. Okay, I have to pay school fees. Uh, I have to make sure they have food, they have clothes on their back. But actually, you are structuring someone for the society, whether you like it or not. So today I look at my life, I look at how far I have come, the things I have survived, the things I've been through. I trace a lot of my strength to my upbringing. And, and by saying that, let me also highlight, I was raised by a he for she father. Well, I have brothers, I was raised with brothers and I have a sister, but my father didn't raise me as a girl. I'll underline that. He took us all as children. I wasn't raised with can'ts and impossible, impossible settings for me as a girl child. Because from the early age, my father used to tell me, you can do anything you want to do. You can become anything you want to become. Well, to him, he wanted me to become a doctor because he felt that was the ultimate <laughs> achievement. My For daughter is a child. doctor. Yeah. He, used to he used to tell me, mm -hmm. the day they will call you Dr. Barbara, I'll be so proud. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not a doctor. But with that kind of upbringing, I never thought there is anything I couldn't do. Okay, I can't do math and science, but, <laughs> but you get what I mean. Yeah, I do. So now that's my father. With that kind of upbringing, when a child has a strong role model of a father or a father who empowers him or her, because our boy children and our girl children need strong fathers who mentor them, who encourage them, who empower them, it's amazing what this will do to a child. Now that's my father. On the flip side of the coin, my mother exemplified the things my father told me I could become. So when my father told me you can be anything you want, you can dream, you can do all these things, you can be independent, you can go for your dreams, you, you can be anything you want, you just need to work hard and be confident and be consistent and put in the efforts and time. My mother lived those things. She was a hard worker. She my was mother a... Was, a, was a hard worker. My mother was a patriot. Uh, I get to write about her in the book. I get to tell her story. She was a dancer. She was a creative. And uh, I, I remember growing up, she used to participate in a lot of concerts fundraising concerts for the liberation struggle. She used to dance. We used to have practices taking place at our house. We used to have people coming. My mother used to visit the front lines. The things my father told me I could become, my mother showed me how to become those things in action, how to become those things. And uh, she used to work for the Bank of Kigali. Mm. When we came to Rwanda after the genocide, and she worked for the Bank of Kigali for quite a number of years mm. until she retired. Today, I'm actually, uh, I'm very empowered and supported by the Bank of Kigali. Mm. In this journey of publishing, of launching the, our initiative, so we have worked with Bank of Kigali in our lives, but why am I coming back to this? My mother used to, because she worked in the bank, she used to come home with work. Okay, that sounds workaholic, but anyway. She used to come home with work and work at home, work on files and, and show me that you have to work. She used to wake up early in the morning and go to the office. We used to go to the office where she worked and I used to see where she worked and I was like, wow, working for the Bank of Kigali is huge. So she was a go-getter, she was an independent woman, she was strong, and uh, she loved people. So that shaped me. From an early age, I was told, I was shown that I could dream, that I could pursue my dreams, and it was fine. So when I talk about shapes, like you said, there is no shape without me, there is no me without shape. 
I, I, I take us to the beginning with this book. I take us to the beginning and the beginning of all of us is family. Mm. The beginning for all of us is, is the first hands that hold us. Our father's hands that hold us, our mother's hands that hold us. The words our parents tell us. If your father tells you you can do it, there is no one who's going to tell you you can never do it. If your mother tells you and shows you that, look, if I can do it, you can do it. There's no one who is ever going to tell you that you can never do it. So the beginning of my story and Davis, the beginning of all our stories yeah. is in our families. Mm. So even as I wrote this book, I, I reflected a lot on the role of family in, in shaping us, in shaping the nation, in shaping our future. Mm. So I've been also doing a lot of thinking. I've been thinking, hmm, so where are we going? Where, where am I going with my, with my sons, with our children? What kind of men do I want to raise? Because if after 30 something years, I could write a book and it's going to inspire lives, I'm thinking parents out there, how are we setting our children for the next 30 years of the country? I pick a lot of things from you are bringing. Mm -hmm. Your parents have shaped you. Indeed, they have shaped you. They have made you to become the person you are today. Mm -hmm. But what, who do you think you would be if you, you were unfortunate to come from a family which is not supportive, which is not loving? You're praising your father. You're saying the role your mother has, pay, has played in, you, in, in your life. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What do you think you would have become? For a person maybe to know the value, the role of the family, of a parent in transforming a child or who they will mm -hmm. become in the future. Even as I say that, that I was fortunate enough to be, to be inspired, to be mentored, to be equipped by my parents, also in the book, I recognize the role of other mentors in my life, other, other leaders, other people who have shaped my life, whether leaders, whether friends, whether family. I also recognize that it doesn't mean that if you didn't have a good family, you won't turn out fine in life, mm -hmm. you see? Mm -hmm. Because we have people who haven't had the privilege of being raised uh, in, in such family settings. It's now you're going to talk to a person yes. who was yes. unfortunate yes. to get a family like yes. yours. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what I tell those people is that, okay, you grew up in a family, you didn't get what you needed, but now you are here. What decisions do you make about your life? Because even in the book, I get to share my personal decisions beyond my upbringing. I get to share how um, I found myself in situations that probably my parents wouldn't have approved of. They, they didn't approve of anyway. So at the end of the day, there is the, uh, the foundation is the family, mm -hmm. but we grow up in life, we go to school, we, we get a job, we, we have other mentors in life. But what do we do with the opportunities that we, we are offered? What do we do with the relationships we have? What, do we, what decisions do we make? I may, I may come from an alcoholic family, but does that mean I should become an alcoholic? Yes, there is the background, there is the foundation, but we as humans eventually reach a point where we have to decide mm -hmm. who we want to become in life. Yeah. Whether we come from good or not so good families. Because even though I praise my family, even though I acknowledge and appreciate the role they have played in my life, I don't come from a perfect family. Yes, we have to make decisions in life. We have to get back up mm -hmm. when you, your family was disappoint, disappointing. These same people, they are heartbroken, mm -hmm. you know. They have hearts from a family, from a father, from a parent, yeah. And sometimes they can even try to look for forgiveness in their heart or within 
and then it's not easy. You're familiar to that, I think I've read it somewhere in your book. You are still battling and fighting these other voices telling you not enough. And you know, this comes from still the family, yeah? Yes. yes. And then there are things pulling this same person, they're saying you're not enough, you mm. can't make it. I don't know if you have the answer or you have a message to this person who is yeah, I, yeah. hurting. What I can tell this person who is hurting is that it's hard and I understand it's hard. I understand it's painful and you're going to need a lot of healing. You're going to need to process these things. But, but you deserve good. You deserve good as well. You deserve a good life as well. You deserve, you deserve a life. You see what I mean? Mm. See, we all have baggage. We all have things we are, we are still trying to deal with. I also talk about it in the book, some of the things that I've had to deal with. And some maybe I haven't talked about in the book, but we all have things we are carrying and we are all struggling. But this person, I would like them to not lose faith in the good not lose faith in the possibility that there is a brighter future for them as well. Even though the past is ugly, even though the past is dark, but I want them to keep holding on to faith that there is, there is a brighter future. Now the details around your way to the brighter future is something else, it's another conversation, but I want them to believe that, okay, I have an ugly past, Okay, I am struggling. Okay, I am depressed. But there is hope. Mm. I would like this person to have hope. And also, mm. recognize that even the struggles shape us. Even the pain, even the challenges, they actually shape us. And, they, and if you want to look at the brighter side, they make you a better person. I am more understanding of certain group of people, of people, because of the things I've gone through. So I wouldn't change anything about my life, whether written in the book or not, whether, because I can't write my 30 something years in, in, in 200 pages document. The hard, the difficult, the painful, the sad, the beautiful, the good, it has made me who I am today and I embrace it. So I would tell this person to reach a point, yes, have hope, have faith, but reach a point where you also embrace the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful. You are a person who, have, who has lived all these things you're saying, yeah? And uh, the reason I want to bring this up again is why would you even write a book if someone who is still hurting not get some help from you? cannot draw a lesson or an encouragement from your story. This is why I'm going to bring this up. Um, as a person who has been through difficult times, yeah, you, nev you never enjoyed them, you didn't. But uh, in your book you say how all these have shaped you to a person you are today. But again, talk to this person who is passing through those things. Maybe it's a heartbreak, you know. Maybe it's a financial crisis. Maybe it's a spiritual crisis. Maybe it's, a, it's something they are battling with. It's a mental health disorder. Person is depressed, yeah. Person is feeling low. And you know, sometimes people commit suicide, but it starts from something small, yeah. But now that we have someone who has been through all of that, and you are here standing. How do people have to behave in those difficult times? That's a very big question. Um, first of all, I think one has to be honest with themselves. Let's start there. Mm. Let's start with me being honest with myself that I am struggling with depression because um, when we talk about mental health, that's a very sensitive topic. I also talk about it in the book. My journey, my, my own mental health. But it starts with you recognizing 
that you need help. This is not working out for me. I need to face my issue. I need to call it what it is. So with our society, we tend not to call things as they are. We, we don't like calling a spade a spade. You call a spade a fork, a fork a knife. It's very difficult for you to know how to conduct yourself in a situation when you're not even to begin with calling the situation a situation. If you are an addict, can you say that I am an addict? So now that you're an addict, what do we do about it? Is there help for addicts? Yes, there is help for addicts. But are we courageous enough to look for help? But help is available. Um, if you may, can I read something for Please. you? Please. Page 171. Lord, help me find my car. I think this is the this is the this is the part that talks about mental health better in the book. So I, I write, over the course of time, I developed severe anxiety and started having panic attacks. I didn't know it at the time and I couldn't understand what was happening to me. I had been depressed for such a long time that it took me a while to acknowledge that I even had a problem. I put it all on God with prayer and the Holy Spirit did help me through it, but I also needed professional help at the time. When I was writing this part, um, I was coming from a place where I, I look at myself and I, I say, okay, I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm Holy Spirit filled. You have everything going on well, everything is good. You're powerful, you're anointed. They are, and yes, it's true. It's all true. You will give me a Bible and I'll preach a sermon at any time. But it will not change the fact that I'm struggling with insomnia. I can't sleep at night because I think a lot. Because I keep replaying things in my head because of A, B, C, D. You see what I mean? So when I wrote about this, it was, about, it was, a, it was in a time where I had been struggling with panic attacks. I was having severe panic attacks. And I had refused to look for professional help because I kept saying, I'm, but I'm a pastor, but I'm, I counsel other people. I advise other people. So, so why should I go and look for help? I have everything together. I've got it all together. Why should I uh, go and open my life to people and tell people that I'm struggling with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, Y, Z? Um, so it took me a long time to get professional help because of course we have stigma around mental health because we, we, you see what yeah. I mean? Some people say it's joke. And some people say it's white people problems. I used to be one of the, of the people who used to really? tell me. I used to tell my friends that those are white people problems. Okay. You know how we see in the movies that someone goes and sits on the couch and they start opening up and telling the doctor this and this is happening in my life. So I used to say, those are white people problems. Until you... Until I had breathing problems. Okay. Until I had panic attacks. Until I, I started forgetting where I had parked my car. Oh. Then my friend told me, you know what, this is serious. You really need to get help. You need to walk into a room and talk to a therapist and just tell them, look, my life is falling apart. So coming back to your question, you have to reach a point where you say, I have a problem. That's the beginning. That's the beginning. I have a problem. Now that I have a problem, I need to get help, professional help. And I'm so grateful that in our country, we, we have systems built. There is medical care around that. There is awareness, a lot of awareness ongoing for mental health care. But we need to find the courage to walk into these rooms, to walk into these clinics and book an appointment. Start with an appointment. You may not necessarily know how it's going to start the first time, but leave your room. Find the courage to leave your room and get help. Now, people, I know someone following this will be like, okay, so why people problems? The common concept people have around mental health is that um, you're going to ask for advice and we are such a proud people 
we tend to think, I don't need your advice. I can do this on my own. But that's not how therapy works. Therapy for me is an introspective reflection on events that have taken place in my life and what they have done to me. If, is, is it healthy or is it unhealthy? And for me deciding to, to grow beyond as we reflect, as we process the traumas of our past, of our childhoods, of our bringings, of what we've been through, as we find healing from them, in the sense that we are not triggered anymore by those things. Because someone could be watching this and when they see their father, maybe they grew up in a family where their father was abusive, when they see their father, they are triggered, they lose it. The moment you see your father, you just want to drink a whole bottle of whiskey or whatever. Or you can't sleep. Or you want to use drugs. What's the thing that makes you want to use drugs? Someone to forget. What are you forgetting? What are, yeah, what are, what are you trying so hard to forget? Problems. Should you forget them? Or should we find a way around solving the problems? Is forgetting the best? These are questions we ask ourselves. Yeah. You, see, you see what I mean, yeah, Davis? You forget and tomorrow you remember. Yeah, yeah. So do we want to forget or do we want to process them and then move on? Get over them. Get over them, yeah. So the first process, the first part, the first step is to recognize and accept. That you're, you are dealing with something yeah. and it's okay to deal with something. We, we are humans, we are broken humans. We are humans in the flesh. I say broken because we need, again, this is where my faith comes in. This is where I believe we need God to help us. To heal? To heal, yes, but let's recognize that we're humans and we're struggling with A, B, C, D, and it's okay to struggle with these things. But can we, can we find the courage to be proactive about what we're struggling with? and find healing and become better. If I was an alcoholic last year and I'm still struggling with alcohol, I want to say that in 2023, I'm, I'm battling less than I was last year. Maybe you haven't made it, but... I haven't made it, but we're, we're on the right journey. We're on the right course. Barbara. You have two sons. Please tell us who do you want them to grow into? Yeah? And how are you planning to manage them as they become teenagers? As they go through <sighs> oh, the, the whole parts of life, yeah? You know how most societies always tell the girl child what to do? This is how you should conduct yourself. This is how you should be. This is how you should be. This is, there is a lot of focus and attention on the girl child, which is good on one side. Girl empowerment, girl child education, all these things are good. But I also feel like we are not paying also the necessary attention to the boy child that we should. We want our our, our, our daughters to grow, to go to the best schools, to achieve all these things and it's all beautiful, it's all good. But we don't equip, we don't teach our sons, we don't um, raise them right. And then some years down the road, this empowered girl child meets this boy who is clueless. Who doesn't know who just knows I need to be a man I just have to be a man but he can't really define and understand what it means to be a man what it means to be a good man and then you put the two in one house and tell them that they have to build a good marriage and everything but this girl child is empowered she understands what it means 
to be empowered, to go for her dreams, to work hard, to dream and everything. And yes, maybe this boy is also a dreamer, he's also successful, but when it comes to the, to the emotions, to the, to the relationship, to, to making it work, he hasn't been really equipped. Probably doesn't have good role models who show him what it means to be a good man. So what happens? Why am I giving this background? The question you asked. I want to raise boys who, who will be good men. Who will be good men in the sense that they will raise awesome children, whether boys or girls. Who will live an indelible mark here on earth. Who will do good works. Who will be patriotic. Who will be loving. Who will be hardworking. Because there is more to manhood. There is more to manhood. There is more than money. There is more than titles and status and wealth and there is more because behind every man the man that we see there is a soul there are needs so i want to raise boys who who will be good men yeah who are not abusive mm. who understands what it means to empower women mm. because the i think i believe the strong empowerers of women are the men in our lives I agree with you. Um, we're coming to an end of our conversation. Mm. Are you a feminist? <laughs> so when we talk about feminism, <laughs> it's very interesting because feminism here in Rwanda is attacked. But uh, let, me answer, let me answer this question maybe with another question. Do we understand what feminism truly means? Before we, we throw stones, because I have seen it, I've seen um, stones thrown at them. But do we really understand what feminism means? Because if we truly understood what feminism truly means, we could find that many of us are feminists. Thank you. I think the, the answer to that question is a yes. <laughs> I'll let you decide. I'll, I'll just give this, this, this homework to our, our followers. Let's understand what feminism truly means. Mm. But I believe, I personally believe, uh, women should have access to equal pay. Women should uh, be empowered. Women should go for their dreams without feeling guilty or made to feel guilty or judged. I believe women shouldn't be shouldn't be put aside because they are successful. And women's success shouldn't be intimidating, but it should be celebrated. If possible, if we could all empower our children, our children, I said our children, but let's be honest, the girl child has been, a dis has been disadvantaged for so many years, so, so many years. So we need to focus and see how to raise our girl children without doing the work in public and then destroying what we've done in public, in private. Yeah. The last but not least, um, what kind of relationship was Lohet, your mother, and Kamaliza? What kind of bond did they have for her to get to sing her in the song? They were best friends. My mother, uh, Lohet Kanhengwa, is the Lohet that Kamaliza sings in her song Lohet. And so many people play that song in weddings. It's a beautiful song. They were best friends. They were neighbors. They lived, they all lived in Burundi, Bujumbura, in a place called Ngagara. And they were they, they had a close bond uh, for so many years. They literally grew up together. So uh, through their relationship I see the magic of, of friendship, of bonding. Friendship that goes beyond the years. Can you believe Kamariza died so many years ago? My mother died 10 years ago, but we're still talking about that friendship. So when I look at mom's friendship with Kamariza, I see the power of friendship. I also talk about friendship in the book, but I also see Picking the right people for us. 
picking the right friends for us. The people who support us, the people who love us, the people who encourage us, the people who empower us, but also us becoming the right people for our friends. Both ways. Both ways. We tend to live in relationships where it's someone is just taking, 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 and they're not giving, 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 and you stay. You stay in that friendship, and clearly you see someone is using you, mm. but you're not getting anything out of it. And then you feel guilty for leaving. You can't even leave. You can't even leave that friendship. So I see a beautiful friendship between my mother and Kamariza, and I do hope and pray that we find the right people for us. We need the right people. Life is short, okay. Not life is short per se, but life is short to be lived walking on eggshells or living with toxic people in our lives. Yeah, I agree with you. Life is very short for us not to have fake friends in life. Yes. And uh, you, the, re the relationship of your mother and Kamaliza is such a commendable one. But uh, uh, Barbara, this was just a tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Where can people find this book? Okay. To get uh, the whole story, yeah? Everything you've wrote. It's going to be in bookstores. Ichirezi, Caritas, and Charisma. But if you want to have a copy of this book, you can dial 079-1212587. So allow me to thank you for making time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. To me, I've read the book and the smallest part I've read, it's really inspiring. It's more of a healing story, more of an inspiring story. I would recommend you to go for the book and uh, please follow Barbara Umhoza on her Twitter handle at Umhoza B. Yes, Is Umhoza that correct? B. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I thank you very much for making time to join us here at the New Times Rwanda. My name is David Sijiro. And for more videos like this, subscribe to the New Times YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Twitter is at New Times Rwanda. Instagram is at the New Times Rwanda. And a very big thank you to Elizabeth Golf Apartment, located in Nyaltarama for the, be the beautiful space. And uh, till next time, take care. Bye-bye.